reading today is from Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 through 15. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow, a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people, because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your fellow Israelite owes you. However, there need be no poor people among you, for in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you if only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near, so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them, and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. I thought she wanted a cough drop up here that was not out of the wrapper. Obviously, she's lost a cough drop that she had in her mouth. <laughs> You'll bow your heads with me. We'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege to come, Lord, and to um, gather together in fellowship with one another. The, the fact that we can come and learn your word and not be persecuted in this country. Lord, help us to use our freedoms to serve you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength to be a light to this world, Lord, so that we can bring glory and honor to you and, and give light into the darkness Lord, that comes only through Jesus Christ. Empower us through your spirit today, through your word, to learn your word and to be um, the examples of Christ in our, our Jerusalem, Lord, and, and beyond that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we gave out um, Thanksgiving baskets this week, and I got, and I'm going to start with this before I get into sermon per se, I got into an interesting conversation for a brief second because as you're doing things for people, you're serving, it brings up that opportunity as Peter said because your life is submitted to Jesus Christ, you live a holy set apart life and you serve one another. So I want to challenge you to that and especially going into the holiday season, how much you're loving and serving. But I had one encounter that the guy said, what kind of Bible do you use in your church? And the first thing I said back to him, and, and I'm encouraging this, and I'm giving this example so that you think about how you answer people, what was his question? You know, you need to find that out because a lot of times you need to get it to what the root of the question is. People aren't just going to come out and say, hey, I'm hungry, I need food. It'll come into conversation this way or, or however that, that looks. So you need to be aware of their needs, led by the Spirit in that interaction and everything. And I asked him, I said, well, what's your question? Still didn't get at it much. But we got talking about different translations, and I'm going to go over that a little bit in the scripture that Mark read here in just a minute, in the translations and the versions of the Bible. Because as we talk, he was King James, King James only. And that may be what you are. That's fine. There's no problem that we're not going to be divided over, over these subjects. 
But I tried to explain to him, I said, you know, the King James was written in King's English back in the 1600s. They had the, the knowledge that they had to translate then. I said, there are some translations out there that might give you a better understanding of what's saying in, in our English. Nothing to cut down King James, nothing to build up anything else. And I said, let me give you an example. I said, King James may translate this as blue. I said, and another translation may translate this because we have more textual knowledge now and everything as aqua. They're both blue, right? Aqua tells us a little bit more. And this other translation may, may translate it light blue. I said, and it added a word in to describe. And that led us to the, the scripture of not to add or take anything away from the Bible, right? So first thing I want to ask you is, that does the Bible say to not add or take away anything from it? It's a trick question. It's a trick question. No, the book of Revelation says that. You can apply that, but if you know your knowledge again, and I'm saying this also that you study and are aware, and you don't worry about tackling these different things, whether they're issues about salvation or issues that divide denominations, or if they're just loving and you're, you're scared, let the Holy Spirit lead you and do it, as Peter says, with meekness and gentleness as you answer those things. Because we know that there's, there's different independent books by different authors, and yes, you can apply one thing to another situation, but be careful how you apply that, and I'm going to get into that later, so that you don't misapply what's being said. When there's Bible versions and translations, there's the thought process of whether we're going to do a word-to-word -word, uh, version, or we're going to do a thought-to-thought -thought version. You understand the difference there? Because there's a big difference. So I can say in a thought process, the water is blue, where in a... Uh, I mean, in an actual literal word, in a thought process to go with what's going along with the story, I might realize that the story is talking about the difference in deep water and shallow water, and then it kind of might be pertinent that you use that light blue or aqua color. Make sense? Now, I'm just saying that to you again because when I read Scripture, and I have the availability of these Scriptures out there that people, scholars, have gone and said, this is accurate, then I trust that to be accurate. So as I read through, I'll read this translation, maybe in a parallel or whatever, this translation, to get as much as I can out of it. But I do that when I'm reading, that I'm reading a letter from my Father to me of how to be more like Christ in this world. And if you're doing that, you should be changed by God's Word, period. Because you're being led by the Spirit, the tr truth is being revealed to you. So as we read through what Mark read... Let's talk about that a little bit because as you read through Luke this week, maybe you read different translations. Maybe you went to another book and said, oh, this is familiar in Matthew when you read there. Maybe you went back into the Old Testament because as we've read through the Old Testament and pretty soon you're going to be through reading the Bible this year. Old Testament included. And I got another devotion ready for you next year and another challenge. <laughs> Just letting you know. So that's a different devotion down there. Don't get it yet. I'll explain more later. So in Deuteronomy, we see some of what Jesus is talking about when he expounds upon Scripture. Because again, if we don't know the theme that's going on, the heart of the matter, we say, okay, thou shalt not murder, I'm not guilty of murder. That, and Jesus expounded upon that and said, have you ever been angry with your brother and not, and not let it subside? You're guilty of murder. You've got to know what God is getting at if you're ever going to live like Jesus in this world. If you're ever going to be transformed and your, your mind changed so that the Spirit can transform you into the image of Christ because that's the reason you're still living and breathing today is so that you can be like Christ in this world. To tell others of the great salvation that you have. So if we look at De Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 1, at the end of every seven years you must cancel debts. Why? Because we're not supposed to hoard up things. We're not supposed to keep idols or everything else. We're supposed to rely on God for daily bread. Get the theme here that's going across? Get what Jesus is trying to tell you? The King James Version says to make a release. Well, I don't know what that really means in King James, so I'm glad I'm reading from the Bering Study Bible here that tells me to cancel debts because if I only read King James only, I might not understand what that release meant just because it's not in my English. Nothing is different there. Verse 2, this is how it is to be done. The Berrien Study Bible, that's NIV, the Berrien Study Bible says this is the manner of remission 
or the King James Version uses release again. So the NIV here, this is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. Oh, some translations use neighbor. Oh, that takes me again to another part of Scripture where the Pharisees are trying to rely on the law that they know and say, well, who is my neighbor? It's everyone, right? Including your enemy. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people, neighbor or brother, because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. It is the Lord's release. Now I get back to King James. Oh, the Lord is releasing them from debt. Oh, thank goodness for Jesus Christ who has released me of my sin debt that I owe to God. You may require payment from a foreigner. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, is King James. Uh, that one would have lost me. <laughs> but you may cancel or forgive any debt your fellow Israelite owes you. Takes me right back to the Lord's Prayer. To forgive, to cancel debts as I have been forgiven and released by God. You can take the Old Testament, you can take the New Testament, it all points to Jesus, it all points to a God who created us to be in a relationship with Him. We sinned against Him, and He's trying to renew us back by faith alone in Jesus Christ so that we will live like Jesus in this world and show others the true light that has come into the world. Verse 4, however, King James Version says, save that's a noun, huh? Not a conjunction. However, is a conjunction. King James Version, the save, literally means if you go back now and study the Hebrew and you go into commentaries and stuff, it means an end or no further. That's a lot different than however. Because this is what God has done for his children. There is an end to this. However, there need be no poor people among you. That's exactly what happened in Acts, isn't it? They were changed by the power of the Holy Spirit and they sold property that they had and they gave it to the apostles. They didn't worry about how it was distributed and everything. It became a problem. They had to, to, to get elders in the church and stuff to, to handle this ministry of serving people by taking care of their needs. But it was to such a point that they didn't consider things their own. God gave them so they didn't build up rich, bigger storehouses for their own selves. They helped others have equality. So there wasn't haves and have-nots because I'm worried about the things I have or the love that I have for money. I don't care about them anymore. I care about others because Christ died for us even while we were his enemies so that there were no needy people among them. Deuteronomy 15 came to reality in the first church. Wow. Where are we at today? <clears throat> For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, He will richly bless you. That's why I have anything that I have, the breath of life that I have, grace upon grace upon grace, because God has given it to me. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised. He's the one that's faithful. And you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will have such an abundance that you can be a light to anyone in the world if you truly believe and follow after God's commands. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. This responsibility that goes back to the garden of ruling over this creation, of being good stewards that God has given us, not being hard-hearted, not being uh, caught up into idols, not committing adultery with our love for Jesus Christ and our love for others. Verse 7, If anyone is poor among you, your fellow Israelites, in any of the towns of the lands the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Opposite of tight-fisted would be be generous, giving, kind, loving. Rather be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Hmm. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year of canceling debts is near so that you do not show ill t toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. Oh, the seventh year is coming up, so I'm not going to do this because if I do this, I've got to release it. Aren't you glad Jesus released you from your sins? Oh, it's so awesome to read the Old Testament and put it in light of what Jesus Christ has done for us. 
They may then appeal the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Oh, and I got to go right back. It says, give them whatever they need open handedly, not hard heartedly. Because the reason that I wouldn't give them open handedly whatever they need is because I have a hard heart that tells me I can't trust God enough to give me what I need. Or I don't love them enough, but God love me. Forgive, and it will be forgiven, right? That takes me to the Good Samaritan, doesn't it? Who didn't know the law. And you read some translations and it might say something like that scoundrel Samaritan because that's added in, but it's so that you'll understand the story better that the Israelites viewed the Samaritans because of their half-breed, half-religious issues as trash. But yet... The Israelite, as you study more, that was in need, had a need and his pastor didn't take care of it. He walked on the other side of the road. His fellow church members didn't take care of it. But this dirty, rotten half-breed did take care of his need. Who is your neighbor? And not only did the Samaritan take care of his need, the Samaritan went out of his way to make sure that the need was fully met oh that takes time and energy pastor I can give here but I don't want the, the commitment to keep following up to see if their meet, needs met next week and next week and next week this week I talked to a lady that I helped um, and she just she's bashed me before <laughs> but she was just bashing the church and said you know I, I've, I've I go for help to the church and I get all these games because they don't really love Jesus. And I'm like, boy, there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. She said, you agree? I said, yeah. She said, one time I was somewhere and went to some mega church, it wasn't near here or whatever, it doesn't matter. And she said, I had to fill out a 14-page benevolence fund. And she said, a month later, I got a, a $50 grocery card in the mail. I said, what did you eat for the other 29 days of the month, 30 days of the month? She said, exactly. I know we need to have guidelines. The Ministerial Association has guidelines. You should have guidelines. You should set boundaries. But you should do it with a loving heart, not a hard heart. You should give generously to those that ask. And we're going to get to what Jesus' words are in Luke <laughs> here in a little bit. God supplies rain to the good and to the evil, doesn't he? And he supplies grace to those who will choose it. And you are an administrator or an ambassador of grace as though he was making his reconciliation through you. Verse 10, give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, of this, the Lord your God will bless you and all your work and in everything you put into your hand. And I could put that into a prosperity gospel. Would that be wrong again? Because <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm going to get everything Jesus told his disciples that. They said, we've left everything for you. And he said, don't worry. He said, you're going to get back in this world, world a hundredfold. I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> he said, and then eternal life. Because you'll be producing fruit that proves that you are who you say you are. You are a child of God. Verse 11, there will always be poor people in the land. Well, what happened in Acts? It said there were no, poor, need, no needy people among them. That was this week. That was today. <laughs> because tragedy befalls somebody tomorrow and the next day, and it may be something they did to cause it. It may not be something they did to cause it. Does it really matter either way? How many bad decisions have you made? And besides that, are you judging? Or do you have a judgmental heart? And are you withholding grace that God so graciously gave you because you were Christ's enemy when you came to the cross? And he said, come to me. Forsake the world and come and follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. Therefore, because there will always be poor people, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelite. We get the word command in there. Who are poor and needy in the land. You get a little description of poor. It's needy. Poor, the description in the Hebrew word is anybody 
that is less than, whether they're oppressed, whether they don't have the money, whether they, whether they are disabled, whether they're a leper, less than others. And you have the ability to help lift them up. And I think of the Beatitudes and everything, what Jesus says. Well, there's, a, there's a physical meaning there, but a spiritual so much more. Blessed are the poor. Well, they are if you are a Christian, because then you come to them and help raise them up and tell them it's the name of Jesus Christ. And blessed are you, the poor in spirit, that you realize that you are bankrupt before God. There's nothing you can do to pay for your salvation, and you don't deserve it, and He graciously gave it to you. So why would you want to withhold that from anyone else? Why would you not want to raise them up when you can? That's the, that's the purpose of the church. Verse 12, if any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Now not only are you releasing them, but you're going to give them something. Oh, it goes on to say in verse 14, supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Now I've got to say this because it happens all the time. Are you going to go into your pantry and get the outdated food that you don't eat? That's not what it says to do here when you're supplying a food bank. It says to give them liberally from your flock the best. Because you know God will supply you, don't you? Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. I don't want to take the run of the litter then because I want God to bless me with quality cattle, don't you? Especially so that I can help others who are in need, whatever that need might be. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Oh, how that points to Jesus Christ. That is why I give you this command today. Not to be hard-hearted, but to be kind-hearted, compassionate, loving, giving, giving freely as God gives you. Now take those verses in light of the cross. Now take what I just said and, and put it to your own life. How much do you trust the Lord? How giving are you? How much are you making a difference, especially to those who are less than for whatever the reason is? Jesus fully explained God's law. He was the light that came in the wor world, the wor word that was made flesh and lived among us. And the poor gathered to him in groves because what he could offer them physically, then he tried to offer them spiritual food. Correct? That's what John 6 says. The crowds gathered together and he, said, and he said to them, you only want the physical bread I can offer you, but if you eat of the bread of life, you will have eternal life. He healed, he healed people and, and then he had the confrontations with the Pharisees and says, what's, what's greater, that I healed this person or that I forgave them of their sins? We look so much to the physical and forget the spiritual. You giving generously out of a loving heart shows Jesus Christ more than anything else your words will ever say in this world. Period. We are called to be a holy, set-apart people, different, counter-cultural from the world around us, especially different than the government, which is supplying a lot of needs, God to a lot of people, because what if the government wasn't there to supply their needs, and especially if the church has an image of, of this and that, would the church step up and be the hands and feet, or would we hold on to it because our hearts are hard? The history of Israel shows that we would stay hard-hearted, stiff-necked. Do you love God and love others, which is the fulfillment of what the Old Testament says about, about mankind and about God's plan? This is a fake example story, okay? And it's meant to be funny, just so you understand this. There was a man that came to me and said he was having problems in his marriage. He said, I just don't love my wife anymore. Well, my answer back to him was, what does the Bible say? Husbands, love your wives, right? He said, but you just don't get it, Pastor. He said, I just don't love her anymore. So I said, well, I'll tell you this. Move out of your house and move somewhere next door down the road. What good was that do? I said, then you can love your neighbor. He didn't like that answer. He said, no, Pastor, you just don't get it. 
I despise her. I despise the ground that she walks on. She's like my enemy. Do you love your enemy? Do you understand this? The love that God gave for you when He gave His one and only begotten Son that you could be born again, children of the Most High, that you would be called sons and daughters of God, children of God. Are you aware of this salvation you have and are you working it out with reverent fear and trembling? So what are you going to do with Jesus' commands? And do you look like Jesus in the world? So let's talk about ministering. I had a guy, and I'm giving you real examples in what I've said otherwise. So we'll go back to that. I had a guy bring me a couple of turkeys, and he called me first and said, um, can I get them to you? And I said, yeah, hey, meet me here and stuff. And then when he got there, he said, tell me about the ministerial association. Got to know his question again, see what he's getting at. I said, what do you mean? Well, how's it functioning? And I said, good, what do you mean? Well, I heard because our church wasn't part of the ministerial association anymore and blah, blah, blah. I said, let me tell you this. I said, where two or three are gathered together. I said, the ministerial association is functioning. We helped, and I put these numbers down, 91 families is what we handed out baskets for. Now multiply that times the number of people in each household. Okay? Not bragging, not, especially not put, put, presenting here. I'm telling you what we helped just Tuesday. No conditions, no nothing else. Just sign up. I, we have helped. I started to say I because <laughs> I write the check. Let me explain that. We have helped over 40 families with their rent and utilities in Boundary County. Boundary County, that's where we serve, our Jerusalem. Ministerial, which means serving. Association, a group of people. Because your church doesn't participate or your pastor doesn't participate doesn't mean there is not an association of people that are ministering and serving Boundary County. And I said, it's functioning fine. Thank you for your help. You just became a part of ministering to Boundary County. I said, so if it's just you and I, we are ministering to Boundary County. And that's not you and I. There was people here helping today, and there's more than that. My point is, is there's a good opportunity to minister, to tell people that it is, because Satan's going to try to attack everything that he can. Ministerial association doesn't exist. Well, I'll tell you this, so you know this. Since COVID, a lot of churches and pastors haven't, we got out of the habit of meeting together. Isn't there a Bible verse about that? That doesn't mean that God is still not supplying needs and it's still not that, doing what it's supposed to be doing and that we can't do more to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So are you serious about Jesus' commands to giving to the needy? There's one way that you can do that. Okay? But maybe Jesus meant to keep things in our own house, right? Not to go out. No, you know that's not the case. We're supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world, and it, heart, it disheartens my heart to know that we can't come together as children of God in so many ways to help the needy and to share the word. So my sermon title was, was, I came up with was Looking Through the Eyes of Jesus. I say what I say before this and use that scripture to say, who should we be looking at then? Well, first of all, we should be looking at the needy in the world. And Jesus gathered together and ate with the poor, the decrepit, the sick, the tax collectors even. And he was looked down because he did that. But if Jesus didn't it, did it, shouldn't we? Doesn't his commands tell us? Didn't he say that he'd, he'd come to help the poor? To bring freedom to the captives? Isn't that what he said? But so many times churches would look more favorably about the rich man that came into the church for the first time. Oh, look who's here. Versus the drunk came, that looked for, came looking for Jesus. 
Jesus had a special love for his sheep, yes, but he lavishly loved Judas just the same that last night, did he not? And then he told him to go and do what he must do. The parable of the Good Samaritan coming up, I mentioned it before, is only found in Luke's gospel. It answers definitively how we should live, who, how we should look at our neighbors, and definitively that the church, those religious, many times do not. Love in action is an expression of God's love through His people. Out of a loving heart that puts your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and realizes the grace upon grace that they've been given. So can we be an even more of a light to our community? How? Regardless of other Christians. So I told you I got a devotional for next year. I'll go ahead and give you a, a, a little insight. And yeah, you can go ahead and take devotionals if you want, but if we start them next year. The green devotional was actually written in the year of 2022, or for the year of 2022, and the red devotional was actually written for the year 2023. So your dates will be off just a hair. Easter might be off even a week, depending on how it falls. But like if you read Thanksgiving, the one that was about thankfulness was on Friday instead of Thursday. Yeah, because it was designed for last year. But that's okay. It still, it still fits just the same. You can be on your Definitely. Rejoicing and giving thanks all the time. Anyway, here's, here's my challenge, is not only for you to read through that devotional, and in the devotional, again, there's a reading plan for the entire Bible. You could just do New Testament only. Don't tell me how to have time, first of all, but whatever you choose, okay? Because you have time for what you want to do. But you can do the reading plan for the whole year. You can do the reading plan for just the New Testament. You can do just the devotional with its reading plan, whatever you want to do. I challenge you to take one again and read it, Okay, and apply it to your life. But I also challenge you to get a prayer partner, iron sharpening iron partner to hold accountable in this church and one outside of this church. So that means when you come and get a copy, so that's why I'm telling you go ahead and do it so I can order more if I need to. If you do it outside of this church and you're reaching outside, they can be a Christian, not a Christian. I've already got my person picked out that I'm going to give it to. It's a woman who said the church is this way, because she's right. And what I finally answered to her back was, you know all that matters, because you know these different things, is your relationship with Jesus Christ, not theirs. And you can be a light to them as well as to the lost. So I'm going to take her a devotional, and I'm going to follow up with her to see if she's doing it. How much you follow up is whatever you guys do. But that's what I'm going to challenge you to do. <clears throat> and then to challenge you to serve as much as you can, to love as much as you can, not, not to miss those opportunities, but to ask Jesus to show you, the Holy Spirit, to show you the opportunities where you can serve. So this week you read Luke chapters 4 through chapter 7, verse 30. And remember that Luke wrote an orderly account and I apologize to you, and you should come up to me afterwards. Don't do it necessarily in and with, with, with the utmost respect. And tell me when I said something wrong, because last week I said something wrong. And I didn't catch it till later in the week. I was telling you who Luke was, and he was a Gentile. He was a doctor, a companion of Paul. He wrote his gospel and his lineage, for example, all the way back to Adam, where Matthew's lineage was back to Abraham. Because Matthew wrote for this purpose... And he wrote to show the Jews that Jesus came from Father Abraham. Luke wrote his lineage to show that Jesus Christ went all the way back to Adam, that he is the God of all human beings, of humanity, and salvation is being offered to everyone. And I said that he was a Gentile, and I don't know what all parts I said. He wrote more words of the New Testament than Paul even did. Probably wrote some, if you haven't thought about it before, while Paul was in prison and he was beside him. So this imprisonment helped uh, not only write a lot of the letters of Paul, but, but um, Luke's as well. But when I said that Luke was a Gentile, he wasn't one of the 12 disciples, I either said or implied that John Mark was, and John Mark was not. So catch me when I do that. John Mark was probably Peter's 
disciple. He may have walked with Jesus, may not have. But I don't ever want to say anything up here that's wrong, not that that's heresy, but point it out to me so that I can then re re give a rebuttal for what I said. Because sometimes your mouth goes faster than your brain. Just saying. So I want to clarify that. But we read Luke, and you've got to consider his orderly account, what he's writing, the, the purpose that he's doing it. And if you remember that he said that he wrote about all the things that had been fulfilled among them by Jesus Christ. Everything that the Old Testament says, and he didn't have knowledge of this prior, but studied and studied and studied God's Word so he could rightly handle the Word of Truth, that there are other people that wrote accounts, some that went into the Bible, some that did not. Um, and he wrote this orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, royalty, loved friend of God, so that you might know what Jesus taught us. Not taught me, taught us. So we know how to live, and we have the continued work of his in the church in Acts. In chapter 4, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, and he answers Satan's temptation with these three questions. If you went back, or these three answers. If you went back to Matthew, you'll see there's a little difference again. They're not in the same order. So study God's Word. See what that means to you. Jesus' answers to Satan's temptations, though, are the same things that we can answer Satan's temptation with. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So how much are you in God's Word? How much are you being led by the Spirit? How much do you have fellowship with one another? It is also written... Worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. How many idols do you have? How much are you serving God? Not just worshiping, but serving Him by doing, by being His hands and feet, by being a priest, by offering sacrifices, by praying for others. It also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You say you're a Christian, but you don't live like Christ. Ooh, that's a scary place to be. Those are Jesus' answers to Satan's temptation. And then Jesus begins his public ministry in both Matthew's account and Luke's account. Jesus' next words recorded in Luke, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now I said before that means poor in spirit, yes, but it also means poor in this world because it is easier for those that are poor in this world to accept a Savior than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven because he relies on those riches, those idols that he has. And he won't ever let God be God in his life in a lot of cases. This is where the thought process comes in, where you, where you need to study Scripture. Those that are poor and needy need you to take care of their physical. They need you to take care of their spiritual if you are a judger of persons, you will tend to not do that to the ones who need Christ and are probably more accessible to hearing the Word of God. Also, you are doing what God has told you regardless of the outcome. You are trusting God and giving of your time, energy, money to help others because that's what God does. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, those that are bound up in however way that, that they can be free, and true freedom comes in Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ only. And recovery of sight to the blind, to those who have never known uh, light, and to those who think they have light but are still living in darkness, to release the oppressed. We have to go out and do those things things. They don't happen on their own. They have to happen by being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus began his public ministry by quoting those things. A little different than Matthew's again. Because Luke's purpose in writing is to tell every one in the human race, no matter who they are, no matter what their condition is in life, that God loves them so much that He sent His only begotten Son to, take, to save them from their sins. 
Are you presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you doing, are you being an ambassador? Are you going, and are you going beyond just Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria of all places and to the ends of the earth? Matthew wrote, I just have to remind you of that too because it applies. Repent. That was Jesus' first words after the temptation. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand or the kingdom of heaven is near. That's why we have to understand about kings and kingdoms. And kingdoms belong to the king and they pledge their allegiance to the king and serve the king and the king takes care of their needs and they don't have anything to worry about from a good king. Will you follow King Jesus and not worry about anything else in this world? Will you put your trust in Him? The birds do. And then Jesus' next words say, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Repent, change your way of thinking so it changes your heart, so that you think and believe as God wants you to as His children. Then forsake all this world behind. Leave it all behind and come and follow after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Things you think you can't do on your own, and all of a sudden then you'll be, because you have a generous heart, because you know the compassion that Jesus Christ gave to you, you'll want to give to others. You'll make a difference. And just maybe as you're fishing for men, there'll be some catch along the way. Good news to the poor. Anyone who has a need. Liberty, sight, to be set free. To find favor of God through the things that you do. Luke chapter 5. Luke calls his 12 disciples, those out of the crowd that will come and follow him, that will leave the rest of the world behind, that will forsake all so that they'll have an abundance of treasure on this earth, but with that comes trouble and sorrows, possibly even death, because we deny ourselves and take up our cross, an instrument of suffering and shame and death, and follow after Jesus, now whether, whether it, wherever it takes us, but we know that that way leads to eternal life. Jesus cleanses a leper, one that is poor in this world. Jesus heals, heals a paralyzed man, one that is poor in this world. I'm not talking about financial so much, although those things probably go hand in hand. And he couldn't have healed the paralyzed man if his friends wouldn't have brought him to Jesus, could he? Compassion, action based on your faith because you know Jesus Christ is the answer to the problems. Jesus calls a tax collector. Oh, he's got money and everything. But do you think that money has brought him anything? He abandoned his own people, betrayed his own people for the love of money, if that's where you want to look at it. Jesus knows that that doesn't supply his needs. And he calls them to come and follow him. The poor, the despised, even the hated, even those who love money. And Jesus has accused himself of being a drunkard, being a sinner, because he shows compassion and hangs out with that crowd. Are you willing to do that? Lowell would go down to the bar and spend time with people. Or do you turn up your nose or make excuses? Or do you simply say, you know, I, what I got is mine. What are the things that you need to lay down at the cross? Luke chapter 6. Maybe we should think of things a little differently. But certainly we can't heal anyone on the Sabbath. <laughs> Boy, that brought up controversy, doesn't it? Do you know Jesus healed more people on the Sabbath than any other day? If you look at Scripture. <laughs> and he probably just did it because he said, you guys are religious hypocrites, I'm going to show you. You read the law, but you have no idea what it means. You tithe down to the finest thing, but you don't have a heart that loves God and loves others. 
which that's why I started with Deuteronomy. Natural human nature will tell you what Scripture said. It's the sixth year. I don't get a slave today. We need to wait till the eighth year and get a slave then because then I can have him for that many more years. It will benefit me. Even we make sense in our own logic like Judas, Judas did with the money. Maybe he did give to the poor as he was accused of from the other disciples. But he also kept some for himself. Do you give to the poor so that you will get rich more? That's the prosperity gospel thing again. Is that your motive? God will bless you and bless you and bless you as you bless others. How? I can't tell you. It may, not be, it may be that you live in your poverty and give out of your poverty, but He will bless you because lives will be changed, people will be saved, you will have brothers and sisters in the kingdom of heaven, even if it's one So then we saw the difference in those who are blessed and those who are woed. Blessed are you when? Are you blessed? Blessed means that you're in right standing with God. You are His child. Your sins have been forgiven. That's what blessed means. Or are you woed because you still are cursed? You live under the curse of sin, the power of sin, the penalty of sin. Whether you think you see light or not. Whether you do mighty miracles in the name of Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. And so that, that on that day you stand condemned in your sin. Blessed are you when you're poor, hungry, and weeping. Physical but spiritual. Do you, are you poor in this world because you love others, whether you're rich or not? Are you poor in this world because you realize that no matter who you are, think you are, you're only saved by the grace of God? You're no better? Your righteousness is filthy rags? Are you hungry for righteousness? Hungry for being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ? Are you hungry to bring the gospel to other people? Are you weeping and sorrowful for the sin that is in this world and the way it goes? I know every one of you here thinks that this world is getting worse and worse every day, especially this country. Well, what do you do about it then? Well, I don't know what to do. Well, then reach out to just one person this week, like I said, with a devotional. Start there and then make the next steps the next week and the next steps the next week. So all of a sudden it's something that you, your heart is focused on and you have these opportunities that the Spirit's bringing period to you because you're walking in step with the Spirit and the Spirit's giving you these gifts and graces so that you can give them to other people. The God of all comfort has comforted you so you can be a comfort to others. Just by taking a devotional to someone, you might get an opportunity to pray with them, spend time with them, anything else. By making the one first step. That's what Peter did. He walked on water, didn't he? <clears throat> Obeying King Jesus, getting your hands and feet dirty, helping those who need the help, fixing your eyes on Jesus because He's the King king of the kingdom of heaven that you're helping bring to earth so the sermon on the mount is that what we read next not exactly we read the sermon on the plain there is a difference and I'm going to read you sermon on the mount briefly first so that you have that for I read the sermon on the plain and that's what I'm closing with I'm not going beyond that even though we went into chapter 7 from Matthew chapter 5 verse 38 to 6 2 you have heard it said this is the way of thinking that it was there may be truth to that, but let's expound upon it. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yep, okay. But Christ's way is more than that. But I tell you to not to resist an evil person. Oh, well, an evil person steals from me, we cut his hand off. That's justice. Could, could be. But Jesus says, I tell you not to resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go uh, one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to uh, borrow from you. Wow, that's different. Countercultural, isn't it? doesn't tell you to get run over. It's not telling you to do that at all. It's telling you to have a heart that loves 
rather than a heart that wants justice because God, God will handle the justice. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The new commandment Jesus has given you to love as He loved and gave Himself. You have also heard it said, here again we need to change our thinking again. We've just had this thought process about how we have rights as human beings to do this and that in the world, and that may be true, till you've also heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Hmm. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. There's the outcome. Two ways that you need to change your, with your thinking. Justice is God's. You need to be loving and have a kind heart. And you need to love even your enemy. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Those who love money. And if you greet only your brothers, brothers, those that are yours, Israel, fellow Israelites, what are you doing more than others? Don't the Gentiles, the rest of the world, do the same? Hmm. Give out of a loving heart to everyone in this world, even your enemy, because Jesus Christ gave to everyone on the cross every sinner for every sin, every enemy, which was everyone, because He is a God of love. And you've been given that message of reconciliation. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be complete. Be mature. Be careful not to perform your righteous acts before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, dot, dot, dot. When. Not if. When. You give because God has given to you. Now, that's just a portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Go back, read more and everything. And the only reason that I am reading that to you is to compare Luke's. Luke's Sermon on the Plain, because if you look at how he's constructing stuff, it would be a teaching of Jesus. A lot of my sermons are similar, but at a different time with a different intent, because Luke wrote with a different purpose in mind. So his details might be a little different. They might not be in the same order, as I pointed out to you on Christ's answers in the temptation um, from Satan in the wilderness. You'll find it in Luke 6, 27 through 40 is what I'm covering. Starts out with, but to those who will listen. Because Jesus already gave his blessings and woes, but guess what? A lot of people won't listen, will they? They say they do. It goes in one ear without the other. Or they say they do, say, so yeah, that love your enemy thing. I know it's in the Bible. Yep. And I do it. I think I've done it once in my life. Whatever it might be. But those of you who listen, here is the way of Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Similar to Matthew, love, and because you love, you do what? You do good to everyone who is my brother, who is my enemy. You do good to all of them. That's why I gave you the funny thing about the man and the woman. So now he's moved from the point of, can't love his wife, so he's got to love his enemy, <laughs> which is a culmination of scriptures if you get to that point. If he gets to that point, him and his wife will never, ever be separated again, right? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. How many of you in here are right-handed? Put up your hand. Oh, majority. Okay. We know that Matthew said it was right, so we'll imply that it's right on Luke. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You've probably never thought about this. But if I'm right-handed and I go to strike Barry, how am I going to strike him? Bap! Backhanded. Which is the ultimate insult. It's not just slapping. You're not good enough, period, Barry. I'm going to backhand you, you lowly piece of... Wow. That's who you're supposed to turn the other cheek to. Not to be overrun, nothing else, but because you have love in your heart. 
A lot more conditions, okay? This is to tell you who you ought to be in Jesus Christ. To realize the grace that you've been given. And if someone takes, Matthew used sues. Either way, takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic as well. I always say jacket and shirt. So if you sue me, I'm going to use you, Barry, sorry. You sue me, whether you're my neighbor, my enemy, or whatever, or you just take it out of vengeance and take my coat, I'm supposed to offer you my shirt also. I don't know what needs you had or what motivation you had or anything, but you take it and I don't do anything. What speaks even louder? I say, here, Barry, take my shirt also. Maybe it was cold. Maybe it wasn't. doesn't matter. But now, not only have I given you what keeps me warmth, what I need to rely on, but I've exposed myself and made myself naked before God. Throw it all out there on the table. And the person sees it. <clears throat> Give to everyone who asks you. There's the very next words of Jesus. And if anyone takes what is yours, don't demand it back. And now I, I don't have a shirt or a coat. And I've already, he's the one that I wanted to backhand, or he backhanded me, actually. And I'm not even supposed to demand it back. What kind of justice is that? Oh, thank goodness that I have been justified by God through Jesus Christ. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Do you get it? But Jesus isn't done there. If you love those who love you, what credit is it? Matthew said reward. Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. Now, I got to sit here and say, am I a sinner? I, I thought I was pretty righteous in Matthew's. <laughs> now Luke's coming at me with a word that is translated in this version as sinner. Maybe I'm not as righteous as I think. If you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them. Oh, now Luke, put this in here. These are Jesus' words inspired by the Holy Spirit. And lend to them, expecting nothing in return. Don't you expect when you lend somebody to pay you back? Maybe you ought not call it lending anymore so you don't have that chain of thought again. Maybe you ought to think it is gifting so you don't expect anything back. And you know what? If you do that also, that person doesn't feel obligated anymore. And usually if there's money involved and someone loans someone money and the person can't pay it back, then they kind of never see you again, right? If you gift them something, they come maybe and thank you more. Just my, my thought added to it then your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High. For He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful compared to perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If you learn mercy, which is what you received, then you're on that road to completeness, becoming more and more like Christ. So you can be to the point of no greater love than a man have to lay down his life for his friend. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Given it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. No prosperity gospel, I'll say that again. For with the measure you use it, you will be measured back to you. Now, I also want to say here another misquoted scripture is this do not judge and you will not be judged let me put it into Allen's translation do not be judgmental that's a big difference because it's who you are as a whole what you do it's okay to judge it's in scripture that we should judge inside the church it's okay to judge outside the church if I can build up a relationship with Barry enough first to then say the problems you have are this because I have spent time with him and he realizes that and it's not offensive because I've done it with meekness and gentleness. There's judging that's involved, but it's to bring him to salvation. 
And I'll help you with those problems, Barry. And the answer is Jesus, and he's the only answer. You're still going to struggle with these problems that there are until you realize that Jesus can take all of that from you. Okay? So don't misquote that. Don't be judgmental. Then Jesus ends with this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Aren't you supposed to be leading people to the kingdom? Aren't you supposed to be light in this world that exposes darkness? Aren't your good deeds supposed to shine that they may see the Father in heaven and glorify Him? Oh, wait a minute. The next words are, will they not both fall in a pit? That's what the Pharisees were doing, the hypocrites were doing. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be what? You can answer it. Like their teacher. So is Jesus teaching you the way, the truth, and the life? Are you listening to Him? Are you following Him? Oh, these are some tough teachings, but they're the, exactly what Jesus Christ did for you. Will you do it for Him? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a wonderful, awesome God worthy of every bit of praise, glory, and honor we could ever give you. All that we can give you in return is the life that you've given us through the Spirit to be your children. Father, empower us by your Spirit to be like Jesus in this world, to go and to do things, to expose ourselves, Lord, to take risks, because we know that there's no risk out there. Nothing man can do to us anything else that will separate us from your love, and you will give us everything that we need. Father, we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.